Praise the Lord. I praise God for the brothers. Amen. There's a word from the Lord tonight. If you have your Bibles, Bishop, I invite your attention to the Old Testament prophecy of Jeremiah. Last night we looked at the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. I invite your attention tonight to a very familiar passage of scripture, for which again you may not need your Bible if you've been in church a little while. But Jeremiah chapter 29 is our text tonight and verse 11. And I'm reading tonight from the New International Version of the Holy Word of God. And this is what it says. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope, a hope and a future. That's enough. Praise God for his holy word. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. For the time that is ours to share together tonight, I want to talk from the subject, a promised future. A promised future. Permit me to introduce or reintroduce you to this band of brothers and sisters about whom we spoke last night. These same individuals, the chosen ones of God, the children of Israel, are before us for examination and consideration on this Tuesday night. We learned last night that these are the favored ones of God. These are ones who ex have experienced his faithfulness, his loving kindness, his leadership and his loyalty has been on full display as they have gone from generation to generation. Here again, the testimony of these Israelites these who love the Lord with all their hearts and are loved by the Lord, they are favored by God, so much so that they are called the apple of his eye. These are they who have a relationship with God because God has brought them through so much that all they can do is lift up their hands in celebration to a God who has been with them through every scene, setting, situation, and saga of their lives. Here's the story of the children of Israel, these who have been so favored by God that they really kind of thought everything was always going to go their way. They had, res they had been rescued by God over and over again, and now they're in a season of suffering and a season of frustration and a season of challenge that they never anticipated. If you were here last night, you already know what that season is. It's a, a season called exile. They're in captivity. They've been taken away from their homeland and especially from the temple that was in Jerusalem. That was the place where they met up with God, where they knew they could feel the presence of God. It was the place where they knew they could, they could have sanctuary. And now they're away from there and they are in Babylonian captivity. And if you will recall from last night or from your Sunday school classes of years ago, you know they'll be there for 70 years. For seven decades they have to deal with the bitter, cruel taskmastership of Nebuchadnezzar and those who will succeed him. They have to deal with the rough reality that they're in a space and place where they really don't want to be. And I don't know if anyone in church tonight has ever found yourself in a space and place where you really didn't want to be and you had to be there for an extended period of time. But as I look back over these last two and a half years, I know what that may have felt like just a little bit. To be isolated, separated from everything near and dear to you. To be in a space and place where you did not intend to be and you couldn't do anything about it just had to be stuck in that rut and have to wrestle with the reality for an extended period of time. Hear these people, God's chosen ones, and while they're there, as was the case last night, because of God's faithfulness to these individuals, God raises up a prophet to speak into their lives to let them know that even though they're in a space that they don't like, God knows exactly where they are. And he knows exactly what to do for them and he gives them a recipe by which they can feel some kind of relief even in the midst of the strain that is upon them. 
Here they are, the children of Israel in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And while they're there, God speaks to them first last night through the prophet Isaiah, tonight through the prophet Jeremiah. And when he speaks to them, listen to the beloved words that Jeremiah gives to them in letter form. That's what Jeremiah chapter 29 is. It's a letter to the exiles. And that hallmark of the letter at verse 11 goes like this. I know the plans I have for you. Those plans are to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Do you hear the loving words of the Lord that he speaks to these who languish in this strange land? Do you hear the words of the Lord as he lets them know that despite the challenge they face, this too shall pass. Yeah, hear the Lord speaking to them through Jeremiah, letting them know that everything's going to be all right, that God has plans in the midst of their predicament, that God has a purpose for their pain, that God is in the midst of this and that God is going to relieve the burden in his own time. I like it, church family. I love it to be sure because God speaks lovingly to those who are languishing in this land, letting them know that everything's going to be all right. It is a future message for a present tense reality. That God lets them know that despite what you face right now, this will not be the only thing you have to deal with. You're going to get to the other side of this. And I don't know about you, but I like it when God speaks to let me know that I'm going, he's going to work things out for my good. That he's going to show to me another side of his graciousness and his grandeur. That his glory will be revealed. God says, don't let this situation make you think this is the only thing I got for you. <laughs> And something else is on the other side. And you may as well know, I may as well give you the whole story. They are in this situation. Not because Nebuchadnezzar was so big, bad, and bold. They are in this situation because of their disobedience and disbelief. Yeah, okay, one person clapped. Uh-oh, everybody else got eerily quiet. Nobody else even nodded your head because nobody in church wants anybody on your road to ever make to be, ever believe that you've ever done anything out of disbelief and disobedience. Nobody wants to be reminded of their disbelief and disobedience, but here's what God is literally saying to these people. I want to do something in you before I do something for you. Before I take you to where I'm taking you, I I want to make sure I get some of the stuff that's in you out of you so you don't take to the next level the same stuff that has held you bound in this one. Yeah. He says, I, I, I know <laughs> the plans I have for you. Those plans are to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. And I like that because God is thinking of their not yet while they're still in their right now. Uh, and that's a good word for somebody in this church today. Somebody who's been frustrated, irritated, aggravated as a consequence of your right now, your present predicament. I need to tell you that God is working on our not yet while we're still in our right now. Listen again to the words of the Lord. I know the plans I have for you. As a matter of fact, if I were to give point to this, to this little gift, to this to the first point to this little message, I would say that you and I, when we are in these extended exiles, these protracted predicaments, may I suggest that you and I need to concentrate on the providence of God. Yeah. Somebody shout concentrate. Let the church say providence providence big old five dollar theological words that these preacher scholars like to use it literally means that God goes ahead of us God sees before us and God begins to work things out for us even while we're right here so that by the time we get down there all we'll be able to say was if it had not been <laughs> for the Lord who was on my side I don't know where I would be providence pro video the combination of those two words literally means that God sees ahead <laughs> that God goes before and that God begins to work things out for the good of his people and I don't know how you feel about that tonight Grace but it blesses my socks off that God can see down the road as a matter of fact old saint said it like this he sees the end at the beginning and God is in the process while you sitting in church of working out your next week and your next month and the end of 2022 all the way into 2023 and somebody ought to be grateful that God loves you enough to go ahead of you go before you and work things out for your good 
you with us last night. You found out how God does that. God says, listen, I'm going to go before you and I'm going to bring down the high places and lift up the low places and straighten out the crooked places and smooth out the rough places and my glory is going to be revealed. Is there anybody who wants the glory, the command of God, the reputation of God to be revealed in your circumstance? God says, everything you've heard about me, I can show you in your own time. Everything you found out about me, I can prove it to you in your own time. If you will concentrate on my providence instead of your predicament, you will see that I work all things together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. I know the plans I have for you. Literally suggesting that no matter what's in your right now, I can still f f figure out you're not yet. I can work out you're not yet. While you're right here, I'm working on your down there. Oh, oh, Saint said, while you trying to figure it out, he's already worked it out here. My brothers and sisters, this, this prophet Jeremiah tells the people of God on behalf of God that they need to concentrate on the providence of God. Why? concentrate on the providence of God because all too often when we're in our extended exiles, our protracted predicaments, all we can think about is the negativity of our situation and we can't focus on the God who is with us in the midst of it. Have you ever been there <laughs> where you were stuck in the mire of your moment and you could not seemingly change your mind about anything? All you could think about was what you did not have and how things were not working the way you wanted to work and what pain you felt. And it was so difficult to change your mind, to elevate your thoughts because we get so fixated on the negative that sometimes we can't concentrate on the positive. Oh, let me be real clear. Come on, everybody who knows this to be true, just at least look, amen. Everything in your situation ain't bad. Come on, even when you've been in your worst circumstance, everything in your circumstance was not bad. You still had a God on your side. You still had a God who gave you mercy every morning. You still got a God who gave you grace that was sufficient for your situation. Is there anybody in here who can testify? Every now and then, I got to change my mind. I, I, I grew up at Emmanuel Baptist Church, 8301 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, where Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry was my pastor. Yeah, had to say it like that when I was growing up. And uh, when I grew up at Emmanuel, we used to sing, I love the hymns of the church, we used to sing four hymns every Sunday. Every Sunday, Lord sent, we sang four hymns. We, we, we sang four hymns. This was after devotion. Y'all do devotion around here? We had devotion back in the day. Now, in our church in Houston, we don't do devotion. Back, back in the day, we had deacons' devotion. That was when they deacons would line up across the front of the church. One would sing a song. One would read a scripture. Another one would pray. And he prayed so long that he'd be just, he sweating by the time he finished with his prayer. And he sweat so long. I guess that was the only prayer he had prayed all week. So he sweat so long that by the time he was finished, he'd be hooping. And he'd hoop better than the preacher could hoop. Nah, Lord. He'd do all that while he was praying. And then they'd sing another song. Then they'd sit on the front row and go to sleep till after service was over. That's how the deacons work. Yeah. That's, that's, they worked that. They worked themselves to the bone, brother chairman. And so they had to just go take a nap, take a nap, take a nap till the preacher was finished. And then after that, we sing four hymns. Did I mention that? Four hymns every Sunday. First hymn was called the introit hymn. Second hymn was the congregational hymn. Third hymn was the sermonic hymn. And the fourth hymn was the invitational hymn. And we had to sing every verse of every hymn. Pastor Curry said, you're not going to be like them regular Baptists who only sing verses one, two, and four. No. If the songwriter wrote all the verses, the songwriter wanted you to sing all the verses and so we sang our verse you name it I know it I know the hymns yes I do and one of those hymns which was our intro not one of our hymns was we have come into this house gathered in his name to worship him second stanza said let's lift up holy hands magnify his name and worship him third stanza went like this forget about yourself concentrate on him and worship him. That's my word to somebody. Don't forget my point. Uh, my point is sometimes we get so bogged down in the stuff of our lives that we forget that the sovereign is still working on our lives. And I need 10 or 12 people in here who came in with burdens and baggage to say, I'm not leaving the same way I came. Forget about yourself. And for the next 40 minutes, concentrate on him and worship him. 
I know the plans I have for you. I got stuff that'll blow your mind, stuff that'll make your jaw drop, make your eyes pop, and all you'll be able to say is, wow. Has God ever given you one of those wow moments that literally blew your mind? You couldn't stop talking about it? I know the plans I have for you. Those plans are to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. I like it. I like it. When I came in, the associate pastor asked me, he said, uh, what's, what's your text? I gave him Jeremiah 29 and 11. We almost had church in his office because uh, preachers already know that chapter. And then he said, um, well, you going King James Version? I said, no, new international version tonight. But I know the King James Version, Rhea. King James Version, God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Whoop, I like that. God literally says, listen here, while you're in the midst of your frustration, I want to know, do you have enough faith to expect me to bring you out of it? I want to know, can you expect that times are going to get better? Can you expect that trouble won't last always? Can you expect that the storm is passing over? And I want to know, is there anybody at the Grace Baptist Church tonight who still lives a life of expectation? If you know who your God is, you ought to expect that times are going to get better. Expect that the Lord will make a way somehow. Expect him to pay your bills. Expect him to heal your body. Expect him to save your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and the like. Anybody in here still have expectation. <laughs> Makes no sense for us come to church all these days and nights and leave here with the same kind of low-level expectation we've always had. Don't make sense for us to sing and shout and holler and preach and pray and we still don't believe God's going to make a way. Still don't believe God's going to turn this thing around. Still don't believe God's going to shut down some of the oppression and sexism and racism and classism that exists in our world. Anybody in here still believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Well, expect him to do it. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Don't just look at your right now. Concentrate on your not yet, the providence of God. But may I push it a bit farther? Because I submit that not only must we concentrate on the providence of God, but secondarily, I suggest that you and I must, watch this, activate the plans of God. <clears throat> Somebody shout activate. activate. Somebody say plans. plans. Activate the plans of God. Uh, there are certain seasons where God works on our behalf. There are other seasons where God expects us to do the work that we're able to do on our own behalf. Don't, don't you hijack your hallelujahs. Don't you arrest your amens. Keep talking to me. Because I may as well warn you, if you didn't get to, to at least rejoice a little bit on point one, you may have to wait till point three. Because point two is the point of responsibility. Because God literally suggests to these Israelites, listen here, I want you to do what you can do. And then once you do what you can do, I'll show up and do what you can't do. God help me preach tonight. God says, hey, 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 I'm not doing everything for you. Some stuff you can do for yourself. I've given you ability. I've given you acumen. I've given you expertise and experience. And I expect you to do some stuff yourself. Yeah. It's right there in the text. I'm not making it up. I left verse 11. Just jump back up to verse 5. Because in verse 5, God says, this is it, through Jeremiah. He says, watch, watch. While you're there, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit thereof. I want you to get married and have children. When your children get grown, let them get married and have some children. I want you to seek the peace of the city and pray for it. Because if the city has peace, you'll have peace as well. Okay. All right, you missed it. Let me give it to you again. Rewind, press play. God says, here's my plan for you. This is the plan you got to do for yourself. In point three, I'll do some stuff for you. But in point two, you got to do some stuff for yourself. Here it is. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit thereof. 
I want you to get married, have some children. When your children get grown, let your children get married, let your children have children. Uh, I want you to seek the peace of the city and pray for it. Because if the city has peace, you'll have peace as well. God says, I want you to do what you can do while you're in this situation. As a matter of fact, this is how God suggests it. I want you to be productive in a painful predicament. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, no, don't try to get in on it now. Everybody want to get in like a wave on the ballpark. No, you should have clapped when I first said it. He says, I want to know, do you have enough confidence in me that you can get yourself up, dust yourself off, and be productive in a painful predicament? I want to see if you can move forward when the tide is against you. Uh, I want to see if you have enough confidence in me to do something in your situation that will have lasting results beyond this extended exile. I want to know, can you be productive? And the word of the Lord is, I have put enough in you, says God. So that you can be productive in any scene or season you find yourself in. That we cannot just sit around having pity parties because we don't like the predicament we find ourselves in. God has given each one of us the ability, the creativity, the ingenuity to do something even in the midst of a painful predicament. Time is out for black people just be sitting in a corner bemoaning our situation. Talking about how much all the folk in the world are against us. No, God has put enough in us in this season of our existence for us to get ourselves up and be productive even in a racist situation. Is there anybody in here who says, I refuse to let my life pass me by and I sit idly by and do absolutely nothing. God has gifted me, graced me, endowed me, enabled me, and I got to do something. Build a house. If you don't build a house, buy a house. If you don't buy a house, clean your house. But by all means, do something. Something. We were shut down for two years, year and a half, two years, however long it was. And God gave us time when we were shut down to do something that would yield productivity by the time we got on the other side of the pandemic, you knew good and well you were supposed to write that book, and you didn't. He did. You knew good and well you were supposed to start the business plan, at least write it out and start the business later on. You knew good and well you should have gone back to school. Everybody was online. Everybody was online. You knew good and well you should have. When I walked in here last night, I almost shouted out my shoes when I saw y'all had redone all this stuff in here because you were productive in a painful predicament. Get yourself up, child of God, and do something. God gave you time. To change everything you want to change. Even yourself. You knew you were supposed to go to the gym. You knew you were supposed to lose the weight. And if you couldn't get to the gym, just walk down the block. Just walk just to the end of the block, walk back. Do something. I want to know, can you be productive in a painful predicament? And I'm messing with somebody tonight. I'm trying to go get to point three. I know you're trying to tell me to move on. I see your face. I'm messing with somebody tonight on purpose. I came to church to mess with you. I came to church to get in your business. I came to church to aggravate you just a little bit because you know good and well there's some stuff God has told you you should be doing and you put it on the back burner. And tonight, this preacher came on his last night. I'm done tonight. And I told you to do something. I want you to activate the plans of God. <laughs> Build some houses. Live in them. Plant some gardens. Eat the fruit thereof. That means you may have to change your diet. Plant some gardens. Eat the fruit thereof. I'm not going to bother you on that. You already know. You got convicted already. Yes, Lord. I want you to be prosperous, productive, in a painful predicament. I done, I'm done with the message when I tell you. Not only must we concentrate on the plans of God. On the providence of God, rather. Not only must we activate the plans of God, 
But thirdly and finally, may may I suggest that when we do that, you and I can celebrate the promises of God. There it is. I told you you could rejoice at point three. Come on, let's have a good time tonight. I said celebrate the promises of God. Somebody shout celebrate. Somebody shout promises. When you understand that God makes promises to his people, that's reason right there to celebrate. Now, now, all of us know that the nature of a promise intrinsically involves a futuristic reality. So you may not experience it right now, but if God said it, it will come to pass. Uh, The Bible says that the promises of God are yea and amen. If God said it, it will come to pass. If God spoke it, he will do exactly what he said he will do. Somebody in, in here has read that, heard that song, I'm standing on the promises of God. It literally suggests that I can stand here and trust God until God works this thing out. And tonight I'm encouraging somebody to take God at his word and to believe that if God said it, he will do just what he said. May I please show you in Jeremiah chapter 29 the three promises that God makes to his people and I'll be in my seat. Watch this. God says, watch verse 12. He says, then you're going to call on me and I will answer you. Then you will seek me with your whole heart. And I will be found of you. And then, when 70 years have been accomplished, I will bring you back from the place you have been exiled to Jerusalem and Judah. Okay, all right, all right. Here it is, let me give it again. I want you to make sure you hear this because we've come to celebrate the promises of God. Now, here's a disclaimer. If you don't like a lot of noise in church, this may be a good time to slip up your Baptist finger and tip out one of these doors because I got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that by the time the next three and a half minutes have been concluded somebody on your road might be making some noise so if you don't like a lot of celebration in church just slip up that Baptist finger tip on out we're not going to talk about you till you leave just get on out there and and we're going to keep on having church here's the first promise God says this is what you're going to do you're going to call on me and I will answer you Secondly, you're going to seek me with your whole heart and I will be found of you. Thirdly, when the time is right, I'm going to bring you back from exile and take you back to Jerusalem and Judah. I like this church. Y'all know how to rejoice. I like your church family because what God says is you need to know that no matter how bad your predicament, I'm still a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. And somebody tonight needs to be reminded afresh that the God you serve still hears and answers prayer. Is there anybody at the Grace Baptist Church who has found your God to be a prayer answering God? Is there anybody who's ever had to call on him and he answered? answered you is there anybody ever heard the word of God say if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much the Bible says ask and it shall be given seek and ye shall find knock and the door will be open is there anybody in here who's ever had to ask ever had to seek ever had to knock and you found out he answers prayer but that's not the only promise God the next promise is God says when you seek me with your whole heart I will be found of you you want to know why some people came to church Sunday came back last night came back tonight coming back tomorrow and Thursday because you seeking something from the Lord that your pew partner cannot reveal is there a witness in this building tonight that when you seek the Lord he shows up in your situation and lets you know everything's going to be all right. the Bible says seek ye the Lord while he may be found call on him while he is near you want to know why some people keep waving their hand jumping up and sitting down jumping up and sitting down they're not trying to offend you they're just seeking something from the Lord that nobody else can provide and is there a witness in this building that the Lord will show up and show himself faithful in the lives of his people he says I'm a prayer hearing God I'm a prayer answering God I'm a God who will be found. 
And when the time is right, when 70 years have been accomplished, I'm going to bring you back from captivity to Jerusalem and Judah. Now this blesses me all by myself because he says I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. Y'all know what Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is the city of peace. God says for all y'all who've been struggling with chaos and tumult and frustration, I'm going to shut all that down and restore your peace. Is there a witness in here who knows that God is a God of restoration and no matter how much chaos and tumult you're experiencing right now he is able to restore I need 10 people in here who's ever seen God restore something in your life to go ahead and celebrate he's the God of restoration he'll restore your joy yes he will he'll restore your peace he'll restore your contentment he'll restore your satisfaction he'll restore a good night's nice rest somebody in here knows that the Bible says he'll restore the years that the locusts have destroyed somebody been depressed for years and God said I'm still able to restore change your mind lift up your bow down head and give you victory over adversity I'm going to bring you back to the city of peace but that's not the only place read on in chapter 29 he said I'm not just going to bring you back to Jerusalem I'm going to bring you back to Judah now Jerusalem is the city of peace but Judah is the kingdom of praise and God says listen here if I got enough strength to give you peace you ought to have enough sense to give me praise I'm in my seat grace but is there anybody in church tonight who doesn't mind helping me close this message and you'll just begin to give God the praise that is due unto his name is there a man woman or child in this place who still believes he's worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same the Lord's name is to be praised so let everything that hath breath praise the Lord if you know he's worthy if you know he keeps his promises if you know that this too shall pass and trouble don't last always I dare you to open up your mouth lift up your voice throw your hands up in the air and give God the praise that he deserves let everything let everything that hath breath praise the Lord because he's going to give to you a promised future. Amen. What he do? 